Now, here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Yes, hello there. Happy Friday. I'm Tiki Fullerton. Every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meets. Coming up... The Invictus Games launches on Australia tomorrow with royal excitement. So beyond the medals, just what can it do for the veterans, many of whom gave up so much in the name of Queen and Country? Invictus Games CEO Patrick Quick Kidd. Employment Minister Kelly O'Dwyer weighs into the debate on annual leave for casual workers, making the government a party in the latest test case. Industry peak body AIG's Innes Willocks on his fear for small business if the issue isn't fixed. And Rabobank's head of financial markets research Asia Pacific, Michael Every, is down from Hong Kong to give us the latest insights on China, the region, and how the Trump-China tariff war is biting. Well, we're on the starting line for the Invictus Games, which takes off tomorrow with what is expected to be a spectacular opening ceremony at the Opera House and a whole lot less controversial than the Everest draw at the Opera House sales last week. Boy, was that a controversy. Ironically, Prince Harry and the Prime Minister planted the Invictus flag just a week ago on the top of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. That was, of course, the first choice for Everest, and I expect Everest was bumped by the royal climb, and quite rightly, too. But moving on. Not only is Inve Invictus and the Games non controversial. It actually has great meaning for a great many Australians, but especially the ex-servicemen and their families dealing often with enormous courage with life after service. The games itself are a focus and lift and the coverage in the lead up around the passionate former helicopter pilot Prince and his games has been pretty much everywhere. The sports running all through next week uh, will inspire a much broader audience, I think, from wheelchair, basketball and rugby to the addition of skilled race driving, which kicks off uh, the Invictus Games tomorrow on Cockatoo Island in Jaguars and Land Rovers. We spoke yesterday to Jaguar Land Rover Global Chief Dr. Ralph Spate, who had just flown in just for the Invictus Games, and uh, he gave us a heads up on what to expect from the Jaguar Land Rover driving challenge. And what they have to do is to drive a car with a precision, with speed, but also with a short circuit around the track in order to win the medal. And that needs a lot of skills, need a lot of, let's say, also um, concrete ideas to win this game. Well, Land Rover has a long history with defence, of course, but for Dr Spate, who has several employment programmes for ex-service folk, it's an important corporate commitment from the whole group. That is a representing partner in the Invictus Games in the very beginning, so for the fourth year now, and we are happy that we are really partnering up with Invictus because from my point of view it's absolutely important that we give the ex-service women and women a new opportunity to be integrated in society and to catch up. So there we are. I think we should say, go Australia! Well, let's get a little more on tomorrow's launch of the Invictus Games. I'm very pleased to have at the desk Invictus Games Sydney CEO, or Invictus Games Australia CEO, Patrick Kidd. Patrick, thank you so much for sparing the time. You must be so busy. Um, what are we going to expect tomorrow? Well, tomorrow's going to be hopefully no rain. But there yes. may be a little chance of that. We're yes. going to start off the day with the Jaguar Land Rover driving challenge, well, Cockatoo Island. Well, Ralph first Spate, motorsport. first motorsport, Ralph Spate gave us a little insight to that. Now, for those who've been on Cockatoo Island, there's all sorts of bumps and, you know, drops and everything else. But this is outside the front in the sort of big flat area out the front, That's which exactly has right. been dressed. I yes, I mean, it's been dressed, it's been prepared. I mean, it's going to be the most challenging competition they put forward yet. This is, of course, the first medal sport for each of those nations and so they're they're all sort of fired up and ready to go it's precision and speed yes so we're going to see water we're going to see thrills and spills we're going to see up and overs and so it's going to be an absolutely sort of brilliant sort of start to the event so very excited Fantastic. as long as the rain stays off we're good well it sounds like it's going to be wet anyway 
Um, so, and then opening night tomorrow night, yeah? Yes, the uh, opening ceremony, the Opera House Forecourt. Um, yep. So that's going to be, I think, a really special moment in time for the competitors and their families and friends. You know, that really is going to be a celebration of where they've got to. It's going to launch the games. Uh, they're going to sort of walk onto that uh, beautiful, iconic vision of Australia and they're going to get ready for the next seven days of tough competition. With, with no doubt the Prince there and Megan? I'm thinking that's probably the case. <laughs> OK, and so the games, the sports, I, I mentioned, uh, I always find the wheelchair sports just so, it's just so incredible. And some of these wheelchairs are incredibly high tech and some of them are not so. That's right, we've got a titanium wheelchair out there, we've got quite normal wheelchairs, but what we've tried to do is to get in the best possible equipment we can so that everybody has an equal start when they sort of get onto the games. Yeah. But I would say actually, Tiki, I mean the individual sports are also amazing. So yeah. when you see the indoor rowing or the powerlifting, what you're really seeing there is these individuals absolutely battling with themselves to do the best they can, and that yeah. in itself is amazingly powerful. So your job, apart from getting everybody sorted and organised and getting the games together, is is very much finding meaning after the games and, and the whole legacy of it. Tell us a bit how, how, about how you're going in that. Yeah, we've been area. working really hard to make sure that this incredible momentum that's been generated around the games isn't lost when we move forward. It's been so, big, hasn't it? Oh, it's, it's been, been huge. Yeah. I mean, we see government coming together with corporates, corporates with not-for-profits, and they all come around this idea of a central purpose. Yeah. And so 100 years since the end of the First World War, there's an amazing opportunity there to get mm. all Australians to recognise what service means, the role of our military within our society. You know, those are important things, but actually the most important message I think is of, is of ability over disability, incredible inspirational stories of what we're going to see over the next week to help inspire a nation. But at a very tangible level, what I want to see come out of these games is a coherent national program that enables, enables veterans and their families to reach out, play sport and connect with others through sport, looking after their physical health but also their mental health. And so well very much in the sport arena? We have to sort of stay bounded. I think that what Invictus shows is that lots of people who just want to play sport, they want yes. to be connected through sport. Yes. Physical activity is good for you. Yeah. When you play sport, you connect with other people. So yeah. if we can just set that up, if we can bring people together, if we can make it easier for veterans to reach out and connect in that way, that's a very positive step in the right And uh, who are you working with on the sports side so to do that? So we've got a great conversation going with the RSL New South Wales and the RSL, who I think yeah. are going to lead the way. We've got great conversations going with the various sporting federations so I'm, yeah. I'm really hopeful that by the end of these games we're going to hear something good. Yeah, because that is, that is really important as well. It's important in the workplace. It's important in education generally. Um, I know there's a breakfast that, that uh, I'm coming along to with you on Monday very much about um, what do they call the Student Veterans Association, which is actually getting vets back to um, some sort of either TAFE or university or something to reskill. Yes, that's right. I mean, so many veterans are challenged as they leave and transition from the services because mm. they haven't got time to go and do the training that's going to prepare them for a full-on life outside of the military. So I think the power of education, the power of skills is really what we need to talk about so that actually people are set for long-term success. And Patrick, I mentioned there Jaguar Land Rover. I know in, in Britain, uh, I mean, I've been through the, the factory, the assembly factory up there in the West Midlands, and, uh, you know, you see veterans there working uh, and, you know, fully employed, and, and obviously that's really important for them. It's important for anybody to have a job um, from, a, from a dignity point of view. But do we see um, other companies here being interested in having active programs? Look, I think we are really privileged to have a bunch of corporate partners who absolutely understand the power of the veteran in the workplace. Yeah. I mean, these are incredible people. They understand teamwork, they understand integrity, they'll give absolutely everything they possibly can. Yeah. Sometimes we don't always see that in the right way. So I think through these games we're going to see some incredible stories about what their abilities are and if we can help to persuade individuals who hadn't otherwise thought of employing a veteran that actually I'd like one of those on my team and you know, that's a wonderful outcome from these games. Mm. Patrick Kidd, I hope you have a terrific game. I'm sure it's going to be a huge success. Thanks so much Thank for coming you. in. Thank you. Okay. Right, OK, we're well, moving to business news now. Hundreds of NAB employees have left the company over the past year following revelations from the Royal Commission into the banking sector. The bank's chief executive made the revelations as he was grilled by the House Economics Committee. Confronting and upsetting, that's how National Australia Bank CEO Andrew Thorburn has described the Royal Commission's interim report. In so many cases, we have not had the care and respect for our customers that we should have. And for that, I'm sorry. 
While that apology may sound hollow to some, NAB has taken some internal action. Over the past year, around 1,200 employees have been investigated for misconduct. Of these, 700 received a hit to their paychecks or received some form of other consequence. And of the 700, over 300 were either terminated or, or have left as a result uh, of the investigation. NAB recently announced it would be setting aside $314 million for customer compensation programs, joining other major banks taking a hit as a result of Royal Commission revelations. Despite all of this, NAB still posted a half yearly profit of $3.3 billion. How come all this conduct was able to occur and yet the banks seem to go from strength to strength economically? There's clearly not enough competition in our banking sector. Commissioner Kenneth Hayne is due to hand down his final report in February. Recommendations for criminal charges are still on the table. Patrick Murrell, Sky News. Switching business to politics now, and it was a messy week for the Morrison government, wasn't it, in the lead-up to the Wentworth by-election. Prime Minister dealing with religious freedom debate, a push to get asylum seekers off Nauru, and backlash over the Israeli embassy review. This is the week in politics. This week, Scott Morrison needed all the energy he could muster, grabbing a quick coffee ahead of a busy parliamentary week. But the Prime Minister couldn't keep a lid on the religious freedoms debate, which spilled over into another week. And will the Prime Minister join with Labor to ensure that teachers can't be sacked because of who they are? But the issues that we need to address right here and now relate to the children. Children on Nauru remains a focus for some of his colleagues. The Prime Minister flagging he is prepared to accept New Zealand's offer to take some refugees if a lifetime ban on visiting Australia is passed. There is a bill still sitting in the Senate. Only to pour cold water on the chances. There's no support for that bill at present. Support for the Nationals leader was also under strain. If anything was offered to me, I would take it. Michael McCormick standing firm. Got the support of the, uh, the party room. From tensions at home to tensions abroad, the Prime Minister floated moving Australia's embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And you don't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Labor and others are cynical about the timing. Just to try and hold on to the seat of Wentworth. The review got President Trump's tick of approval, but it angered some of Australia's nearest neighbours, with leaked messages showing Indonesia's fury and suggestions it could derail trade negotiations. We're allowed to engage in conversations. The government secured a win on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. But it was another vote in the Senate which embarrassed the government. It is indeed OK to be white. The coalition backed One Nation initially only to change their tune. Well, I found it regrettable. It is a matter of administrative error. Another unwanted distraction in the build-up to the Wentworth by-election. Trudy McIntosh, Sky News, Canberra. Well, bringing you right up to date today. Now, the Prime Minister says Liberal candidate Dave Sharma is likely to lose the Wentworth by-election. But Scott Morrison is urging Liberal voters to support the man he says is the underdog as he sets expectations very low ahead of the crucial electoral test. With his candidate in a by-election battle that could send his government into minority, the last thing Scott Morrison needs is distractions. This is why I accept and understand that anger and that outrage, Mr Speaker. Uh, sorry, sorry. Why haven't they given any money to Tamar Surf Club? Why are the kids still Mary, on no Mr Speaker, you can say what you'd like to Please say after. We're here to hear the Prime Minister. No, you won't. You won't listen to us. Let me say what I was saying. These Green voters crashing the Prime Minister's news conference, angry about the government's stance on climate change. 2018, you can't ignore the world's experts. Scott Morrison is more concerned with anger from Liberals, disaffected by Malcolm Turnbull's ousting from the top job. Now, I'm not surprised by the anger and outrage, as Dave said the other day, of a couple of months ago. I'm not surprised by that, and I acknowledge it, and I understand it. He's urging Liberals to stay in the fold despite that anger. I'm asking Liberal voters to do as, as I have had to do as the Prime Minister, to deal with the events of a couple of months ago and step up. And sending a message that Karen Phelps could bring down the government. If I'm elected in Canberra, uh, I will not seek to uh, bring the government down. I will seek to hold them to account. 
The independent candidate is not ruling out voting against the government in a motion of no confidence. Wentworth has always been held by the Liberal Party. Malcolm Turnbull won here with a margin of 17% in 2016. But that margin will have been eroded by the former Prime Minister's ousting from office. His successor is now setting expectations very low. From day one, I've understood that the Wentworth by-election was going to be a very close run race. Scott Morrison even saying he expects his candidate to lose. I think the expectations are clearly set in, in that direction, Tim. James O'Doherty, Sky News, Sydney. Mm, big day for everyone tomorrow. Now, after the break, the government intervening in a landmark employment court case. We'll get more from AI Group CEO Innes Willox next. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. Yes, welcome back. Well, Federal Minister for Industrial Relations Kelly O'Dwyer has intervened in a landmark court case that is causing a rumbling in Australian industry and business generally. The Federal Court in Australia granted annual leave entitlements to work pack casual truck driver Paul Skeen on the basis that he worked regular and predictable hours. Minister O'Dwyer, who's been relatively quiet about the issue, yesterday intervened in the case, joining WorkPAC in its directions hearing. This is quite a development. The company called for a full court to determine its application to have casual special loading entitlements offset annual leave. Ms. O'Dwyer said she decided to make the Commonwealth a party in the case given the considerable concern across Australia's small business sector. It very specifically focused on the um, offsetting arrangements and whether businesses are going to be paying people twice for the same entitlement. Um, if you're a casual and you've been paid 25% loading, uh, it seems uh, completely uh, incongruous to think uh, that that 25 per cent loading that would have paid for your holiday pay and all the rest, that you would also equally be able to pay, be paid for those holidays and other entitlements. It's generally one or the other, but not both, and the certainty uh, needs to be uh, made very clear. That's why the Commonwealth uh, is intervening in this particular case. Well, for more on how that landmark ruling may impact local business, I spoke with CEO of AI Group, Innes Willox, just a little earlier. Innes Willox, great to have you up here in Sydney. Now, um, let me ask you first about Kelly O'Dwyer's intervention today in the court case around casual workers and what they might be able to demand from employers. Well, Tiki, it's really important that the federal government has intervened as it has done in this case. This really goes to the heart of employment in Australia. This is a system that we've had operating in Australia now for decades that is now threatened by this finding in the case involving a member company of ours, WorkPAC, mm -hmm. and one of their workers. And there were quite, um, you know, unique circumstances in that case. But tell us, but... What, what, is, what is the current... <clears throat> state or has been the current state of affairs if you're a casual worker? Well, if, if you're a casual, you get a 25% loading at least, and that mm. covers you off on annual leave and other entitlements that it's a full-time worker It's a buyout, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So it's a decision that a company has made mm. around their, the makeup of their workforce, but it's also a decision that an individual has made about how they want to be employed. And what we find is the vast majority of people who are employed casually like that and don't want to convert to full-time permanency because they like the flexibility. It allows them to pick up the kids. It allows them to study. So, so the first case <clears throat> that came through, which where the judge decided actually this chap was uh, due annual leave as well, the argument was that he'd been there as a casual for a long enough amount of time to have assumed a right to annual leave. Well, that's, this was a quite specific case brought by the C F CFMEU in the mining industry and it related to his rosters. Um, and the decision was brought down and that's fine. But what's happened with that decision is, is that it wasn't just contained to that case, mm. that industry, that sector. It had wide applicability across the economy. And now what businesses are finding are two things. They're finding unions knocking on their doors saying, well, hang on, you're employing casuals, 20% of the workforce, you're employing casuals, uh, pay up. And you now have uh, 
lawyers, ambulance chasing lawyers, to put it bluntly, yes. threatening uh, class actions well, against employers. What would this cost business if, if that went through and it was applied across the board? Well, our estimation is, working from ABS data, it would cost a minimum, a minimum of $5.7 billion. Across to the, business in Across the... business to Australia. The estimate is between $5.7 and $8 billion. Per is it, how long? Uh, going back to take back in over the past couple of years where, yeah. the, where the original case applied to. So it's yeah. enormous... And then, and then, you know, hundreds of millions a year going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And what it would mean would then be that employers would have to rethink how they employ people. Mm. You know, a day after so, we've had so record no low wonder unemployment. So no Kelly O'Dwyer is, um, mm. is jumping in here. She's making the Commonwealth as part of this next test case. Now, what if they lose? What if, what if uh, again, this case endorses the previous decision? Uh, it's, well, it's a different case yes. running on slightly different lines, but if the principle behind it is mm. reinforced, it would be a disaster, quite frankly, for the economy. It would imperil jobs, it would imperil businesses. You've got to think of this, Tiki, over 50% of casuals employed in Australia are employed by small businesses who employ less than 20 people. Mm. So the big losers in this would be small businesses. So it is a fundamental undercutting of the way we do business. So. Right. What the problem here is that the, the term casual wasn't properly defined in the relative act, relevant act. It has been in other acts, so it's about getting definition of what a casual is in the Fair, Fair Work Act, which was neglected when the okay. act was written. Well, and that's something else that we need to be right. done for certainty and clarity for business. We will, we will keep an eye on that one. Look, there has been developments, uh, interestingly, on the um, super side now we've obviously we've got the royal commission going on um there's been su this suggestion that um that uh, retail funds should now have independent boards because presumably of all the, the the gouging that has gone on what's your view on this on retail funds yeah well i think there's a what we've got to look at with super funds so i sit on the board of australian super so mm. i should declare that mm. but what what we have to look at here is the fact that Industry funds have come out of this Royal Commission thus far very well compared to retail funds. Well, incredibly likely. <coughs> we had Ian Silk there going in for a sort of minor little sort of <laughs> with a wet lettuce. Well, and that's it. I mean, well, he's a clever guy. But, well, he's you know. a clever guy, but also I'd like to think we run our fund very well. Yes. And that was reflected in the Royal Commission and the, the job Ian did there. Yes. But the, the, the point out of all this, Tiki, is, is that we are managing billions of dollars. So Australian super managers about $140 billion. We take that very seriously. That is our sole purpose. That is the sole purpose. It's members' money and it's members' first. Yes. When it comes to boards, it's traditionally been a mix of employer representatives and union representatives. Yes. As, and that served us well. But this is becoming more complex, this field, and there is increasing scope for skills to be brought into okay. boards. So, so it's maybe not necessarily independence per se, yes. but it's skills and okay. that's what we need so to look at. So the whole idea <clears throat> of what a board's uh, first job is, and it's member first. It should be member first mm. both for retail funds and for industry funds. Well, the issue has been raised, now let's have more independence on retail funds board because clearly it's about shareholders and profits with mm. all this gouging. Now, on the other hand, when you've got people like Tony Sheldon knocking around the unions, and you've come out and been quite critical of Tony Sheldon, using the whole idea, the, the, the political side of things, saying, saying to the super funds, industry super funds, well, you get in and use your... Um, monetary power, if you like, to pressure businesses to increase wages, even if that meant, uh, you know, it, it, managed, it went against board strategy mm. for growth and all that sort of thing. So why should we not be looking at independent uh, boards across the board? You know. Well, on the Tony Sheldon case, I jumped on that from day one yeah. because that is a complete antithesis of the purpose of superannuation. But it's going to happen, isn't it? We know, we know no, the it, connection it, between it, unions and it industry It will happen superfunds. over my dead body. Maybe at your fund. But what will, about other, other general, unions? Well, we funds? would keep a, a watch on that because that would undermine the entire ethos and success of industry super mm. going back over its history. But where you get money, industry funds now managing more money than retail funds, where you get a lot of money, you can also get a lot of pressure. And we know, I mean, Australian Super now is, you know, pairing up mm. very cleverly with private equity on boards to, 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 mm. to you yep. know, things like health scope. So we know that roles are changing. Uh, if you've got, say, a Labor government in, we know the connections between Labor and indeed the CFMEU people. We read the column inches all the time. Why wouldn't this pressure to influence industry super fund boards on wages of companies come up time and again? 
It's a good. It's a really good question, but it must not happen. Mm. All I was saying to you, it must not happen. If that were to happen, it would be the equivalent of pulling the pin on a grenade and throwing yourself on it. It would mm. completely shatter all that has been good about industry superannuation. So we yeah. need to be watchful about this. It's, it must and what's be wrong with the independence, it, it though? Because I know the government, the government dropped it, you see. Scott Morrison came in and within four or five days he dropped this push that the, the lib Liberals have had for years to try and get independent governance on, on, on industry fund boards. Now we've had this call for independence on retail funds. Why didn't we put, put it back on the table and said everyone needs an independent board? Well, hopefully been, highly skilled. Well, hopefully, but there's been a lot of independence, if I can call them that, on some of the bank boards, and where does that let us? Yes. Yeah. Not, no, look. not so great. So let's look at the skills. Let's yes. look at, have a, be practical about what the skills are that are required on boards as we grow and as there will be consolidation that will naturally occur. Yeah. So to me, it's about skills. It's not about independence for the sake of independence. But, but also about trying to get rid of these sort of big conflicts of interest. Because when we say on industry fund, uh, fund boards, there are employer members and there are uh, union members of the board. I mean, the employer members are very often uh, small businesses. They're not. They're not people like yourself, mm. actually. Mm. So it, it isn't really uh, the big end well, of town versus the union. No. stuck on a board, no. is it? So, with, I could just go back to Australian Super. We have about <clears throat> 265,000 employers as part of our makeup. Mm. So that that is represented by those representatives on the board. And you could say that uh, the basis of that fund has been around various parts of the economy, manufacturing the like, so that's represented by unions. Mm. We are bringing in independence, for, not just at the board level, but also at the board committee level, where expertise is really required and that's that's a really positive thing but that right. independence is based around skills, skills. and knowledge All and right. that's the important thing look um, uh, let's just park that one there because it'd be very interesting oh, to it's see an how ongoing it, discussion it's an don't ongoing worry discussion. about that uh, another yeah. ongoing discussion uh, which is is uh, I don't know where it's going is energy of course now we've obviously had the uh, national energy guarantee thrown out but half of it has come back in it would appear mm -hmm. with the energy minister bringing back a reliability mm -hmm. mechanism the other half on the emission side, I understand that business in various quarters is looking at having some sort of emissions target. In a, do you think that can work? Well, look, we have to be careful here. This is born, what you're referring to is born out of frustration that the system is broken mm. <clears throat> and that it has failed us. Mm. Essentially, we have been failed when it comes to energy policy. And this is at a time when we're seeing prices, particularly in gas, continue to go up an escalator again. So there's now an expectation that gas will be up at $15, $16 a gigajoule How's by the end of the year. How's that going to work? You've got a default price <clears throat> on the cap on the, on the yeah. retail electricity side. Yeah. How's that going to work? Well, it's not going to work. It's going to yeah. be a disaster for business. And this is all tied to international oil prices and look what's happened in Saudi Arabia and Iran. This is, and Australian businesses and households are paying for this directly. Yeah. So we, what we need to be careful here is we don't get more fragmentation of energy policy and energy approaches in response to frustration. So you don't give up hope that we can get a, a proper long-term energy outcome. It's good that the government is pursuing the reliability angle of this. I think where they're a little bit lost is on how to keep get prices down. Mm. Um, we're talking to the Labor Party all the time. Should they be elected, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they were to bring in a version of the National Energy Guarantee. The question will be around where they turn the dial on targets. Mm. You can't give up on a national energy approach. We got down into this morass by having fragmented approaches, states going their own ways. It, that was a recipe for disaster. Mm. We can't go down that path again. I understand the frustration, but we need to be coordinated, and that's the uh, that's the underlying message out Hard of this. To Don't argue. give up on it. Hard to argue with that. Innes will looks great to talk. Thanks. Thanks, Tiggy. After the break, tensions heat up between the US and Saudi Arabia following the inquest over the death of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. What impact would Saudi sanctions have on an already volatile global economy? Well, more on that next with Rabobank's Asia-Pacific Head of Financial Markets Research, Michael Every. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories.
welcome back. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has returned from Saudi Arabia and Turkey, where he's been investigating this extraordinary case of a missing Saudi journalist. Turkish officials say Jamal Khashoggi was murdered inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, as Saudi Arabia maintains they have no knowledge on his disappearance. Sky News reporter Amanda Walker has more from Washington. And I think that the Trump administration is growing increasingly isolated in this notion that there might not be a response. Certainly, we've seen U.S. lobbyists, business leaders already cutting ties with Saudi Arabia. Um, you have Republicans and Democrats who are saying that if the president won't act, then Congress will. But Mike Pompeo not really giving any more information uh, than what he gave on the trip there, uh, saying very much that it's up to the Saudis to conduct their own investigation, which, of course, in itself presents problems and questions, uh, and that once they have that, they will make a judgment on what they may or may not do. But he wasn't lauded for his performance in Saudi Arabia at all, chatting and smiling with Saudi leaders, um, really kind of taking everything they said at face value, uh, saying that he wasn't really, to quote him on the trip, I don't want to talk about any of the facts. So that's led a lot of people here in Washington to say, well, what was the purpose of this trip? Uh, surely it was to go over and try and get those facts and come back to the president with some information but what he's come back with is a very strong clear line here that we're going to let the Saudis give them a few more days as he said um, to deliver a report we're going to then decide if that's transparent if it's fair and make a judgment based on that of course the criticism of that the obvious one is you're giving the Saudis a few more days to essentially come up with their cover story he talked about relations the fact that this is an ally since 1932 that's what President Trump has been saying for the past few days as well we know a big issue here for Trump and Pompeo is Iran. They need Saudi Arabia to keep leaning heavily on Iran. So that's something uh, we know is a priority for them, a big campaign thing for Donald Trump. Well, yeah, that whole idea of needing Saudi Arabia to lean on Iran. Well, what, so what, would, what impact would Saudi sanctions, though, have on global markets if we got that far? Well, for more, very pleased to welcome Asia-Pacific Head of Financial Markets Research at Rubberbank, Michael Every, who joins me live at the desk down from Hong Kong. Great to have you here, Michael. Now, um, so we've got this extraordinary development to come through mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Could it get as far as sanctions? Personally, mm. I still think it's unlikely. Mm. When we talk about Middle Eastern politics, really it's Game of Thrones. Mm. And we're talking literal thrones in the Middle East. A well, lot of the and time. chopping up of, you know, it really is Game of Thrones, isn't Absolutely. it? I mean, it's quite Absolutely. bizarre. It is bizarre. It's very, very unpleasant. And normally, of course, innocent until proven guilty. But given what we've seen of the footage of Khashoggi going into the consulate, you'd imagine the onus on the defense of Saudi Arabia is to produce Khashoggi, and the onus on the uh, prosecution is to produce parts of Khashoggi. And, you know, either one who can do that basically wins the case. Yeah. But uh, I don't think we're going to get to sanctions. Uh, if so, you. So yeah, so if I just stop you there, are we beyond the time where um, where the Saudis can say, oh, look, maybe we did it, but it was just a rogue element and we don't have any association with it? Are the connections between those who actually went to Saudi Arabia too close to the king? They really are, aren't they? The, the crown prince. Yeah, the crown prince, sorry. They, the they could well be. Uh, yeah. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why one of the individuals allegedly involved had a car accident in Riyadh uh, over the past couple of days, and maybe the others might accidentally stab themselves to death while doing the washing up, etc. Mm. Um, you know, what we just heard is correct. I do think that Saudi Arabia has got a few days to scramble and try and put together a face-saving package. But if you take a step back and you think of this Game of Thrones, not just within the Middle East, but globally, between the US and China, between the US and Russia, mm. uh, and with the oil nexus there, right in the middle of this very volatile, you know, hot right. pot. Really? Is this the right time for the US to put sanctions on Saudi and Saudi to respond with sanctions back? And what would happen if that did happen? Well, let's be hypothetical, okay, because as I said, I don't think it will. I could yeah. be wrong. I don't think it will. Yeah. It would be a catastrophe. If you yeah. suddenly saw Saudi Arabia letting Russia in and opening a military base, selling oil for rubles and, and for renminbi instead of dollars, boycotting the US on all manner of fronts and pushing oil prices up to $200 a barrel, Let's say before we got very far down that road, I think suddenly the drumbeat in Washington wouldn't be for invading Iran, it would be for invading Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then, yeah. you know, goodness knows where we go from well, there. But it's uh, nowhere we want to go. No, no. That's, that's almost quite sort of counter to all the setup now. So it's, yeah, I, I agree, it's far fetched. But hey, the, you've got to go invade someone, right? The red, yeah, but the rhetoric <laughs> is, is, is increasing, isn't it? So, what, do we, what is the thinking, do you think, in Washington on this? 
I think Washington really is split. You've already had a split between Trump and pro-Trump elements and anti-Trump elements within the institutions and yeah. the foreign policy establishment. There's still a lot of residual pushback against Trump's pushback against the Iran deal. And of course, the harder you push on Saudi Arabia now, the harder it gets to push back against Iran. Yes. So I think we have to look at that through this particular framework. And let me just add one thing. Whatever happened to Khashoggi looks like being an appalling crime and disgusting. Yeah. There's a war going on in Yemen where you've got potentially a million children starving. Mm -hmm. And we know about this. Mm -hmm. None of the people who are suddenly crying crocodile tears over one guy being dismembered, which is disgusting, mm -hmm. worried about that. And as Joseph mm -hmm. Stalin said, one individual death is a tragedy. A million are a statistic. And yes. sadly, we're seeing that very clearly. Well, that's true. And, and it goes back to the Russian poisoning in Britain. It's this individual thing, isn't it, that just really has some. OK, all right, let's park that one there. Um, trade this how are they? I mean there you are sitting in Hong Kong you've been looking at this right right through that decision to go to 200 uh, 200 billion of goods covered how how are things developing do you think well they go from bad to worse which if you remember is what I did exactly think was going to happen yeah. I mean just this week and it hasn't got a lot of play and I don't know why we've also seen Trump walk away from a 144 year old agreement with China which keeps postal rates very cheap if you want to order something through the post from China you want to buy a new USB cable yes they can ship it to you more cheaply than you can ship from one US state to another. He's walked away really? from that and suddenly this kind of click on the internet, I want that sent to me, that's all going to disappear. It's going to get much more expensive to order things through the post from China because of what Trump just did. Wow. So that, and that, as you say, that, that would, I and mean, if you think about the amount that we order from all over the world, including China, that presumably would impact a lot of trade. Oh, well, it would do. I mean, this is Trump doing it. Australia yeah. hasn't followed suit yet. Yes. But were we to see that spiral, that it's another big blow towards yeah. the internet-based kind of global trade we're seeing do you now. Think it's going, do you think it's impacting on China itself? I mean, how are the markets looking at China at the moment? Well, they're starting to wake up to a view I've had for a long time, which is China's in trouble. Mm. Um, it's slowing down. The housing market, the we bubble. We had those that, numbers, didn't we? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, the numbers were very, you know, backward looking. Yes. And ostensibly, looking down from a helicopter, they looked okay. You know, right. retail sales growth, 9.2, sounds fantastic. Yeah. But clearly, the authorities are worried there. They're worried about the housing bubble, the demographic bubble, the debt bubble, the local government debt bubble, the trade war on top, all manner of different things all coming together at the same time. Mm. And their natural response would be spend more money and cut interest rates. Well, guess what? The U.S. is raising interest rates. Yes. which makes it a very dangerous time for them to be doing it. Yes. But there's no good answer for them. Okay. No good answer. So back over in the US, of course, we had Wall Street wobbling over the last couple of months, a oh, couple of weeks, sorry. Uh, how do you see uh, market behavior over there? Well, I don't think it's actually directly related to the trade war. Uh, I think it's another way that journalists can bash Trump over the trade war by saying it's all trade related. If that's true, why didn't we see the sell off? you know, much longer ago mm. when the trade war really kicked off. Uh, why is it happening now when actually Chinese exports to the US are going up in the short term because everyone is front running the tariffs? Yes. No, I think it's to do with rising interest rates in the US. I think it's LIBOR, the interbank borrowing rate, continuing yeah. to go higher and it's the delayed, delayed impact of that. Mm, mm, okay, so overall, as an investor, uh, how would you see markets, say, if you were an investor down here at the moment? Well, may I use a technical phrase like yes. I usually do? Squeaky bum time. You know, it's, really? a, it's a pretty unfortunate time at the moment. You can spin a positive story out of it if you want to, yes. but the paths to a happy ending are getting fewer and fewer and narrower and narrower, mm. and the roads leading to a messy ending of one form or another are getting wider and wider and more and more numerous. Well, in terms of, in terms of a dramatic correction on equity markets, you mean? Equity markets. It's all manner of uh, different markets. Right, right, okay. Well, oh, goodness me, Michael Every, thank you very much for joining us. Great to see you here. All right. Well, in other news, U.S. President Donald Trump has threatened to use the military to close the southern border of the U.S. if Mexico doesn't stop a caravan of immigrants from Honduras that is U.S. bound. Fox News reporter William La Jeunesse has the story. <laughs> While that caravan continues north, U.S. border agents are already overwhelmed, apprehending 4,000 families and children every week. Many dropped off at bus stops like this in Yuma because shelters are full. This is very typical. Bring them here. They have their tickets. They line up. We make sure they know what's going on. It's seven days a week at the bus and at the airport as well. This family crossed into Arizona illegally from Guatemala. 
Three days later, a Greyhound bus took them to Texas. We've been receiving 15 to 20 people a day at the Yuma Refugee Ministry. The large majority are coming from Guatemala. And agents have nowhere to put them. We have to basically let them go outside our front door or we transport them to, to places where they can get shelter. The border here is 126 miles long. Most of it features a fence just like this. Now, over the last few months, hundreds of illegal immigrants have come over the fence here and injured themselves, ankles, knees, ribs. Why? This fence is more than 14 feet tall. They're breaking their legs, hips, ankles, uh, arms, wrists. Just recently, we had a, a lady jump off the fence holding her five-month-old daughter, and uh, both of them hit the ground. Agents say injuries happen daily. In FY18 alone, we sent approximately 1,500 people to the hospital. Well, that uh, equates to over 9,000 hours of a Border Patrol agent's time in, in the hospital. U.S. taxpayers paid the estimated $3 million hospital bill. For agents, Central Americans present a frustrating case of catch and release. Instead of running and trying for us to chase them and make sure that we don't apprehend them, they run to us. The only thing right now separating the caravan from the U.S. is Mexico, which mobilized its federal police today to stop the group from crossing the river along the Guatemala border. And if that fails, President Trump said he will use the U.S. military to close our border with Mexico. And in other international news now, EU President Jean-Claude Juncker has conceded Britain's transition period out of the EU, EU will probably be extended. Speaking at the end of the EU summit in Brussels, well, British Prime Minister Theresa May remains confident a Brexit deal can still be done, but admits it was always going to be tough. From Merkel to Macron, European leaders hit town till the early hours without Theresa May after declaring insufficient progress on Brexit talks and politely but firmly putting the blame on the Prime Minister not invited to Brexit beers. So arriving at the summit with no hangover from the Brussels nightlife, but certainly so from the Brexit negotiations, the EU27 shelving a November deal summit. The PM putting a brave face on it, quoting fellow leaders, saying, where there's a will, there's a way. We've made good progress both on the withdrawal agreement and on the future partnership, our future relationship. But as this summit was wrapping up, the French President Emmanuel Macron once again deploying an uncompromising message that the need for further compromise was solely an issue of domestic British politics. Is it now up to you to compromise? Isn't it Calais that will be blocked, uh, Mr. President? And that he was now preparing France for the elevated chance of no deal. There is no political compromise, additional political compromise to be made on the European side, as now this is a British visibility to provide on the basis of this different technical scenario following their political compromise. Not that all seemed well on the EU27 side, a heated discussion between European Council Chief Donald Tusk and top EU official Martin Selmayr. The pressure really is now on. The EU is giving the PM time to get beyond an immediate budget pickle. But we're now at the point where choices have to be made and some at home will feel promises broken. Faisal Islam, Sky News in Brussels. After the break, the ASX 200 feeling the heat from a sliding property market. Talk an investment strategy with Perpetual's Matthew Sherwood next. Now, back to Tiki. Hmm, well, welcome back. It's not looking good for the local property market, according to a report out this week from AMP. Property prices in Sydney and Melbourne are likely to see top and bottom falls of around 20% as credit conditions tighten and supply rises. AMP chief economist Shane Oliver says investors should remain wary of Sydney and Melbourne for now and focus on higher yielding markets. Earlier this year we put out a view that prices would probably fall 15% top to bottom in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, we're actually thinking of revising that down to a 20% fall. So I think the reality is that the credit tightening that was starting to become evident earlier this year is actually proving to be a lot tighter. You hear anecdote after anecdote from borrowers finding it very hard to get loans or getting a smaller amount or having to jump through hoops to get that money. You've got the supply story ramping up, a lot of buildings yet to complete to hit the market. And of course, 
they're the two main things. But of course, on top of that, you've got less foreign buying, particularly from China. And you've also got this risk that as prices go down, it creates expectations of more declines, which then causes more selling. So we're actually thinking that prices are going to come down top to bottom somewhere around 20% in Sydney Goodness. and Melbourne. Nowhere near as bad everywhere else. And I think no. it, it would be wrong to call that a housing crash all, all akin to what you're seeing in the, what we saw in the US. I don't think that's on the cards, but it's still going to be a bit rough for the next couple of years in Sydney and Melbourne. Well, for more on property and other inf um, factors impacting the Australian share market, I sat down with Perpetual's Head of Investment Strategy, Matthew Sherwood. Matt Sherwood, great to be able to talk to you. Now, um, tell me, we've had this little sort of disruption over the last uh, couple of weeks in terms of our share markets. Yep. What is the market thinking, do you think, about the, the, the global economy? Well, I think the message from the market the last couple of weeks has been loud and clear, and that is the global economy is slowing mm. uh, and real interest rates are rising. Mm. And typically, that's not a good combination for a market which has high price earnings ratios, and, uh, and optimistic earnings expectations. So they've come off a bit and there's probably a bit more to go. Right, so bringing it back to Australia here, mm. we're still not seeing any pressure on the Reserve Bank though to raise rates, are we? Absolutely not. Um, and we had unemployment down at what the, a level that they would say, well, if it goes lower than this, you'd start to see inflation well, start to With incredible numbers this week, 5% unemployment. Yes, a lot of that was driven by the, a lot of people dropping out of the labour force. The actual uh, payrolls gains was quite minor, but there's no doubt the labour market's running pretty strong in Australia. So we've had around 300,000 uh, jobs created in the last year and three quarters of those have been in full time jobs and uh, the labour market strength has been reflected in the GDP uh, number strength also. The economy is growing at just under three and a half so yeah. you know things are going pretty good in Australia at this stage. But still no pressure on wages, uh, wages growth or anything like that so mm. no nothing, no changes in your view down the track to the RBA? No there's two re three reasons for that I should say. Uh, inflation still remains very contained. Yes. Uh, it's at the bottom of the RBA's uh, range on the headline figure. It's below the, the bottom of the range uh, on, on the core figure. Uh, secondly, there's very little wages growth, as you say. So wages growth does tend to lead to inflation. Yes. And so, uh, therefore, um, wages are still pretty much uh, at historic lows, wages growth. So no, uh, no pressure on that front. Of course, we have this domestic housing market which is looking very fragile, it's mm. coming off, prices are down, uh, all the lead indicators are down, and that's before really interest rates have done anything. So I think the RBA is on hold not only next year, but also into now, 2020. Now, Matt, we've got the uh, Wentworth uh, by-election happening tomorrow. Yes. Uh, now, should that lead to a hung parliament, will that make any difference, do you think, market-wise? I don't think so for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think the government would still be able to get enough support in the House of Representatives to, to guarantee supply. Also, the election's not that far away. No, it isn't. Uh, to be honest, so the Parliament and the and the uh, uh, electorate and the and the markets wouldn't have long to wait. Yeah. Uh, so I tend to think it might be business as usual. It obviously would be disappointment for the government. Yeah. I'd say their chances of getting any further reforms through would pretty much be done. Uh, and, so and, and should should a Labor government uh, come in uh, next time around, mm. we've then you mentioned the housing market there. We've got these reforms, haven't we, uh, that that Labor have on the table for negative gearing. Yep, and also for capital gains tax. And for capital gains tax. You know, and you've got to remember the housing decline we've seen so far, Tiki, has not been because rates have increased. It's just the market just run had run so hot yes. for so long. There's just coming off. But can you see that? Abolition. Can you see those policies going through? Well, I tend to think that if those policies were implemented, you'd see a lot more downward pressure uh, on the housing market. So I would not be surprised that if. Uh, Bill Shorten was to uh, win mm. the election that they might abandon those policies, oh, just really? given the general downturn in housing that is likely to unfold in the next few years. Oh, that's very interesting. Now, what about the other impacts um, globally yep. that, that we're seeing now? Yeah, there's been three key drivers. It's US Fed saying we're just going to keep raising interest rates yeah. despite the pressure we're getting from the US president. Uh, we have, of course, the uh, problems uh, in Italy. Uh, and we have the trade wars. Uh, and China's GDP figures came out today. They're the lowest since the GFC. Not because of the trade war. This is just a lag So what's effect. that number now? The, that uh, six and a half percent, mm. uh, which isn't bad globally, of course. Yes. Uh, but it's uh, the lowest we've had in China in about nine years. Uh, and it's not because of the trade war, because trade wars aren't really in these numbers. In fact, I'd almost say the trade wars are strengthening these numbers because before the next round of tariffs come in from China, uh, 
importers are trying to front run those and get their products in before new tariffs come on. So I suspect it uh, is actually lifting these numbers. And of course, when that when the tariffs come in, the growth will weaken anyway. And of course, you'll get the drag from the export sector. Mm. So China's slowing basically because they've tightened policy, you know, two years ago to curb the, the growth in leverage. And we're seeing the net result of that. And to be honest, 6.5%, uh, uh, considering it was 67 last quarter, would tell you one of two things. It would tell you either there's not much deleveraging going on in that economy or uh, these, these numbers are looking a little bit uh, rubbery. And where, where to for the Aussie dollar? Because that's come down against the US dollar quite a lot. <clears throat> yeah, it has done. Uh, but we suspect that the Aussie dollar is getting pretty close to troughing, uh, primarily because the growth in the US economy is really going to start to decelerate. So the support the economy's got from, from the Trump tax cuts is going to fade very quickly. So growth at the moment's running at four and a quarter. We suspect it's going to be at about three and a quarter by the end of the September quarter, two and a half by the end of this year and one and a half next year. So mm -hmm. the growth slides pretty rapidly and the US Fed's still tightening policy. So, so it means more volatility. Yes, yeah, so, oh, more volatility. But where do you see how low could the Aussie dollar go before it bounces back? Oh, I think we're probably there. You know, yes. it might go a cent down further from here, that's yeah. probably neither here nor there, but I, I tend to th think the US dollar will start to weaken uh, and the Aussie dollar would naturally get a lift out of that. So wait a little before you go on holiday. Yeah, might be just a little while. Either that or just, uh, you know, a uh, holiday domestically. Good plan. Matt Sherwood, thank you very much. Have a great weekend. <laughs> Thanks, Tiki. Cheers. That's all for the show tonight. We'll pick up on Wentworth and Invictus, the Invictus Games on Monday. Thanks for your company.